I'd like to start off by this. Imagine yourself just for a minute that you have a tape recorder attached to your body with an athletic band around your waist, that you have another tape recorder in a briefcase, and a third tape recorder in a notebook, and that you go to work and you go on with your life and you're taping your coworkers, your supervisors, your friends, and from 8 a.m. to 6 or 7 p.m., you're taping every day, no matter who comes across your path, that you're taping them. Now imagine doing that every day for three years. That's exactly what I did do. I was a lot younger man then. I was in my 30s. I'm 56 years old now. But when I was in my early 30s, I met four FBI agents at 6 o'clock in the morning. They shaved my chest. They taped two microphones to my chest. They taped a couple microphones to, to my back. Um, I could not take my jacket off for three years because under my shirt it looked like a Christmas tree. <laughs> and I wore a wire every day for three years, Monday through Friday, every work day for three years. Uh, I was a keynote speaker two years ago, year before last, at Quantico FBI Academy, and they informed me it was the longest duration of anybody wear a wire in U.S. history. They've never had a person wear a wire every day for three years, so it was an interesting life. I'd like to talk to you how I become an FBI informant how I survived becoming an FBI informant, and how I was able to keep my family through some pretty turbulent, some pretty turbulent times. And I tell you, without God, could have never made it, could have never survived it. And the company I was wearing a wire against is no average company. They're known as Archer Daniels Midland, commonly known as ADM. At that time, when I joined them in 1989, 24 years ago, I was 32 years old. <coughs> At that time, they were the 56th largest company in, on the Fortune 500 and the 90th largest company in the world. About 70 billion in revenue. Today, they're about $95 billion in revenue. I think they're number 27 on the Fortune 500 today. But the four people at the top, the four top executives of the company, I tell you, greed became our focus. We all four went to prison. I was one of those four. And we got exactly what we deserved. I got obsessed with the compensation. I got obsessed with the corporate jets. I got obsessed with the, with the seven-figure uh, bonuses and, and seven-figure stock options. And I, lost, and I lost my purpose, what the job was about. And I lost, I lost what was going on around the community and with my family. All I could do is every hour looking at my portfolio. I got obsessed with my portfolio. And like I said, it became almost like an addiction where it was unhealthy. And I, and I really lost my way. And I followed some patterns and I followed a culture that I should not have followed. And I should have stood up and, and not joined some of the things that were happening. Instead, I jumped in both feet and even made them happen even to, to, a, larger, to a larger extent. Uh, you bought a, 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 a huge house, especially for the Decatur, Illinois area where ADM's headquarters are. I mean, I see a lot of beautiful homes in this area, but in Decatur, Illinois, uh, three hours south of Chicago, uh, there weren't many people with 13,000 square foot houses in that area. Uh, there were only about seven of us, the seven top executives of ADM. And I had an eight-car garage, and I filled that eight-car garage with eight cars. I had a Ferrari, two BMWs, two Mercedes, and I did that within a couple months. Because, like I said, this is 24 years ago, and age 32, and, and I just got obsessed with all the bells and whistles and all the trimmings. So then you'd say, Mark, you're 32 years old. You're divisional president of the 56th largest company in America, 70 billion in revenue. Why would you blow the whistle? And our CEO, by the way, was 75 years old. Our president was 69 years old. So the three people above me were well over double my age. So you'd say, Mark, why would you blow the whistle on your own company? Why wouldn't you just stay there, continue to move up the corporate ladder and have the opportunity to become the next CEO just because of age, where I was age-wise with them? Well, the answer how I became an informant and the answer how I became a whistleblower is not because of me. In that news clip where the FBI said I'm a national hero because of what I did, I can tell you they're wrong. The person who's a national hero in this story is my wife. So she noticed lots of changes in me. So one day on November 5th, 1992, I was three years with the company then. And that's when there was a lot of discussion when our 69-year-old president would retire that I would replace him that I would go from number three, from number four to number two in the company. And there's a lot of talk about that. There was even a lot of talk about that in Fortune Magazine and Wall Street Journal predicting who the next successors was gonna be. And they had a successor about 10 years older than me that was gonna be the next CEO and they had me predicted to be the next president. And even within the company, they were talking to me about being the next president. 
And my wife sat me down one day on November 5th, 1992. She was 34 years old. I was 35. And she said, Mark, what is going on in your life? She said, you are obsessed with all this stuff and these things and materialism. She said, we've got cars in the garage, two or three cars in the garage. We haven't had the stickers off the window. And they've been there a year. She said, we have three children. None of them even drive. And we've got eight cars in an eight-car garage. She said, why do we need all this stuff? And she said, also, more importantly, you come home from work at night, you have dinner with us, and you get on the phone to all hours of the night. You're on the phone talking uh, back at work again. She said, why are you doing that? And then until you, you were on the phone until you go to bed. And I said, well, I have to be on the phone at night, honey, because at night, at 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night, our time is 8 or 9 in the morning in Hong Kong and Singapore and Japan. They're 12 hours ahead of us in Asia. And I have to be on the phone with them. She said, you have to be on the phone with them every night? Why do you have to talk to them every night? I said, well, the company showed me how to involve with price fixing. And we're fixing the prices of our ingredients and we're making a lot of extra money for our company by being involved with this price fixing scheme. She said, price fixing? She was a stay-at-home mom raising three young children. She never heard of the words price fixing. She said, what is that? I said, well, we have an international cartel. We get together with our competitors and they're just teaching me how to do it. And we're making an extra billion dollars a year for our company, a billion dollars a year on this price fixing scheme. And she said, is that legal? And I said, it's not legal, honey, but everybody's doing it. Our CEO's 35 years there. This is the way business is done. And the laws are out. I've been told the laws are outdated. The antitrust laws are from the 1800s. And this is the way business is done. So illegal or not, this is the way everybody does it. She said, boy, I don't know about that. She said, well, who pays for that theft that you're stealing when you're fixing the prices to ingredients to go to Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Kraft and Kellogg's? Who pays for that theft? And I said, well, they pass that on to the consumers. Everybody buys about $50 worth of groceries when they go to the grocery store. They pay an extra two or $3, that's all. Two or $3 extra from that price fixing from those ingredients. So the consumers are paying that. She said, you mean my grandma, my mom, my aunt, my brother, my family are paying for that crime? where you guys are making millions and you're stealing another billion dollars a year from the consumers. And I said, it's only a couple dollars. She said, yeah, what about people in social security that make a thousand dollars a month? They can't afford that. She went back up in her room. She came back about an hour later. She said, I prayed about it. I've been thinking about it. He said, she said, you've got to turn yourself into the authorities. She said, you've only been involved with a crime for seven months that I told her. And she said it was going on, and that is the fact. I was only with the company for three years. She said it's a crime that's been going on for 14 years, and you've been involved only seven months. What a perfect time. You're just learning how to do it. What a perfect time to turn yourself in to the authorities. I said, honey, I can't turn myself in. I could go to jail. We'll lose this house, all these cars, all these things I was obsessed with. She came back to me just as strong as she could, as quick as she could. She said, I don't care if we're homeless. She said, you've got to turn yourself in. I am not going to live in a home where illegal activity is occurring. You have to turn yourself in to federal authorities. And if you don't, I will. And like I said, I've known my wife since she was in seventh grade. So I knew she meant it. And within an hour, within an hour from the time I told my wife about the price fixing, a case that was going on for 14 years, 11 years before I even joined the company, I was with them only three years, a crime that I was involved with for seven months but was going on for 14 years. Within an hour, I was sitting with the FBI, with my wife by my side, confessing that I'm stealing a billion dollars a year. Let me ask you, I don't know if any of you ever went to the FBI and tell them you're stealing a billion dollars a year, but it is an interesting reaction. <laughs> and you can see why I was there for four hours. All of a sudden, doors were being locked and phones were being called. They even called Louis Free, the director of the FBI. But the FBI told me that day when I met with them, they said, Mark, you just confessed to a billion dollar international cartel price fixing scheme. Involved seven months or not, you're involved. You either going to jail today for confessing or you're going to start wearing a wire tomorrow. And that's how I became an FBI informant. So in reality, my wife is the whistleblower on the largest price fixing case in U.S. history. 
I'm an informant, and there's a difference between a whistleblower and an informant. A whistleblower tells authorities or tells someone above them because they're doing the right thing. An informant is someone that gets caught and then working with the FBI to get a reduced sentence. So I was an informant and my wife was a whistleblower on this case even though the FBI gave me credit for what happened. I want to talk a little bit of, just switch gear just for a minute, talk about what life was like to work as an FBI informant, not trained as an FBI agent. How many of you ever worked undercover for the FBI? <laughs> well, I can tell you, it's, it's an interesting experience, and I would, I would not recommend it. Now, if you work for an FBI's employee, it's a different story, but as an informant, I would, not, uh, I would not recommend it. It's a very interesting life. These meetings that we had, we had two or three international cartel meetings where we would meet with the top executives of these other companies two or three times a month all around the world. They were not Decatur, Illinois meetings. Those, ex those executives didn't want to come to Decatur, Illinois, 100,000 people city. They were in Hong Kong and Zurich and Switzerland and Toronto and Mexico City and two or three meetings a month all around the world. I mean, we had five Falcon 50s, we had a Falcon 900 and a King Air. So we could fly anywhere we wanted to, anytime we wanted to. Now, following around the world with us was this green lamp. This green lamp is historical. Its history was made with this green lamp. This green lamp made the video feed because the FBI and the prosecutors knew this was going to go to a lengthy trial, that this company was big and powerful, and they were going to go at all lengths. This was a seven-week trial. It was held in Chicago, Illinois, this trial. And this video, this lamp made the video, that had the video camera in it. And the FBI would always be in the next room where these meetings were happening, and they could move that camera to left or right or up or down. They controlled it with a remote control controller, that video and that lamp, from the next room, looking from a monitor, from a screen, from the next room where we were meeting at, every meeting, two or three meetings a month. Now, that green lamp was in the Shangri-La of Singapore. That green lamp was in the Mandarin Hotel of Hong Kong. That green lamp was in the Four Seasons Hotel in Chicago. It was in some of the finest hotels in the world, $1,000 a night rooms. That green lamp looks like it came from a yard sale. <laughs> and I tell you something, I thank God that there was ele the 11 guys that were stealing a billion dollars each for their own companies were all men. Because if there was a woman among us, a woman would have said, you know that green lamp that looks like it came from a yard sale? We're in a Mandarin today, that was in the Shangri-La in Singapore two weeks ago. And you know that lamp was in every meeting room two or three times a month for three years and not one person caught it. And, and they, it was setting no more than two or three feet from where you're sitting at your table. I tell you, I saw firsthand in my life in those three years, greed blinds you. They were so involved with what we were earning on this cartel and how many millions and bonuses they were going to get. They missed what was sitting two or three feet from them no matter what country they were in. That green lamp was right next to them taping them, everything they said, every move they made. I had the audio tapes on me, and the green lamp was making the video feed. But the tape recorder they gave me, the, the equipment the FBI had 20 years ago is not near as sophisticated as today. They had that old reel-to-reel -reel type. Remember the reel-to-reel -reel type? So here's this briefcase they gave me that's now in the FBI Museum also. The briefcase had that tape recorder that I'm showing there, and that reel-to-reel -reel tape was, was going, and it got twisted, the tape did, and started clicking. So here's a green lamp three feet from them that's already following them around for a year by that point. Here's my tape recorder clicking. I'm sitting as close as you are to each other at that table. The FBI watching from a screen in the next room, they could hear the clicking. I open that briefcase, fix that recorder, the FBI about ready to have a heart attack, and I fix that tape recorder and not one person caught it. And I was sitting as close as you are to each other. I'm telling you, I lived it. Greed blinds you that when they saw those dollar signs in their heads and how many millions they were going to make, there's no lamp, there's no tape recorder. There could have been an orchestra in that briefcase, and I'm telling you, they wouldn't have heard it. What I'm about ready to describe was a pivotal shift in this case. After two years wearing a wire, I was out on my driveway at 3 in the morning during a thunderstorm with a shirt and tie on, blowing leaves off with a gas leaf blower at 3 in the morning during a horrific thunderstorm. 
raining, thunder. I mean, I was crazy. I couldn't sleep at night. I had to meet the FBI at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm meeting with them already till midnight, turning over tapes. I had to get rewired up the next morning at 6. So I couldn't sleep during those nights. So 3 in the morning, I'm blowing leaves off this driveway. Couldn't understand why the neighbors weren't doing the same. My wife comes running out on the driveway and she says, Mark, come back to the house. Come back to the family. She said, more importantly, you need God in your life. I said, well, who needs God? I'm going to be president of the 56th largest company in America. And it was just announced in Fortune magazine two months ago. I'm going from number four to number two. She said, Mark, you've got to be delusional. They may have announced you're the next president, but they don't know you're the informant. You're bringing down the chairman, the vice chairman, the president. The board of directors are going to be under scrutiny. They're going to be class action suits. This case is going to be, I don't think you realize what's getting ready to blow up when they learn that you're the informant. Surely you know you're going to be working for someone else when all this is over with. You surely don't think you're going to be the next president. Well, that's how crazy I was. She walked back in the house. I stayed out there for another hour during this thunderstorm. And I said, you know what? She's right. I'm not going to survive this. 